It was very important to Leonie that Dr Lex be held accountable personally. That was utmost in her interests. She assumed his accountability would be central to the Crown's interests as well. And just as she had taken civil proceedings against him, she expected to ensure that there were criminal proceedings and the Crown would be facilitating and ensuring that they happened. She also expected and specifically went back to Crown Law during the settlement process to ask for Dr Leakes to contribute to the settlement. In the end, there were huge pressures to settle. She regretfully and reluctantly did, and without ever being told what the contribution was. Now, some litigation documents arrived in unredacted form. The first lot council got were some of them were redacted. We challenged that, and the unredacted ones arrived after Leonie gave her evidence. But there's one that discloses, that's why I'm referring to it here, that Dr Legs, through his insurance company lawyer, refused to make a monetary contribution, but required this fact to be kept hidden from Leonie, and the Crown acquiesced. Her claim was amended following her successful ACC claim. So here's someone who has ACC cover, but there was not a problem, in the, in, as Dr. Ch Robert Chambers saw it, in her continuing. The primary claim became false imprisonment. In her case, she was detained without any authority. Injury caused by false imprisonment is not covered by the ACC bar. There is a Supreme Court matter hearing in the Taylor and Roper case, which will look at one aspect of that. In that case, it was the fact that Mr Roper locked the doors of the car, detained her in there while he groped and sexually assaulted her. In this case, in the case of all the other psychiatric patients, there's no connection with the sexual assault. The detention was just the detention. So I cannot see that ACC um, would prevent, have prevented any of the Lake Callis people from taking their claims, um, for there being a bar for them. And certainly it was pleaded in a way, Leonie's claim was pleaded in a way that there was not, that, that the bar was not there, that she, she survived the strike out. Hence the claim was justifiably a large one, and as she has explained, included loss of opportunity in relation to education and income earning potential and it was never limited to an exemplary damages claim alone. And it's noted that the Legal Services Agency had to approve the funding of it, so it passed them in terms of prospects of success. Now, when Leonie filed her High Court claim against Selwyn Leakes and the Attorney General, it was not as if the Crown could have been blindsided by the allegations. There had been well publicised serious complaints about their operation of that unit, even at the time Leonie was a resident. Now there was the first inquiry, the Mitchell inquiry, all but exonerated the ECT practices in relation to one person, a young young boy, Haki Halo. But then I think the very next year the Chief Ombudsman did a confidential inquiry after complaints from another group of parents. I think, who didn't even know he was at Lake Alice. And, and the ombudsman there, and I've put the quote there, said um, that there was considerable evidence both medical and psychiatric procedures were imposed on the boy against his will without his consent and without either the knowledge or consent of his parents or the social workers responsible. And his own feeling was that the use of treatment in all but the most exceptional circumstances ought to be eschewed um, if for nothing else but the difficulties of obtaining consent of young people. And then very early in the litigation, Leone, um, in the discovery, all the ACC expert reports were given to the Crown, including ACC's own expert. So the Crown knew very early on that she had cover for medical misadventure, 
and that that was on the basis of inaccurate diagnosis, inaccurate diagnostic and progress procedures, grossly inadequate documentation by Dr. Lex of his reason for treatments, type of treatments, the reason given. Essentially, ACC accepted there was nothing that had warranted her place in an adolescent psychiatric unit or her treatment. And as said at the beginning, those claims raised extraordinarily serious human rights abuses that had happened only 19 years previously. If they were true, then for 18 months, a young teenager, 14-year-old, had been locked up without any justification given electric shocks, painful antipsychotic drugs, held in seclusion, I think she says 21 days, the notes say 19 days, and shared a night ward with seriously disturbed adult patients. Clearly, she would have suffered extreme trauma and had lasting impacts from it. Yet, as indicated earlier, there was no recognition of this in the response of the Crown Law Office in all of the eight years and seven months that she was engaged with them. Setting out some of the concerns about the Crown behaviour, it took seven months for the Crown to file a statement of defence, and the High Court rules allow one month. The file was lost in the Crown Law Office for a while, and Philippa Cunningham had to resend it. Then Crown Counsel took 22 months to provide discovery Typically, this would be provided in three months or less. Discovery was only provided after Philippa had gone to the High Court twice. The first time, she gave them 18, 14 months because she accepted they might have to get records you know, from other places. 14 months later, when Leone's records were still not there, she um, took an application to the court seeking a discovery order and costs, and she was given both. Five months later, still no documents from the Crown. This time, Philippa sought an order to strike out the Attorney General's defence, and the High Court gave that order and said it would be struck out unless the Crown had filed its documents in the next eight days, and Leonie got costs on that as well. It was only then, after two court orders and two cost awards against the Crown, did they engage in the process? Seven years later, the Crown Council advised it had 64, it was either 60 or 64, I might be wrong, and that further files to discover. Now, discovery is an ongoing obligation. It's inconceivable that it would have only received 64 files seven years or seven months later. And I won't talk about Leone's diaries because they have been well covered by her. The Crown's mediation strategies. Um, just after Philippa asked the Crown to sign a price to pay to set the case down for a hearing, in those days, unfortunately, there was no case management conference and you had to get the consent of counsel before you could get a hearing date allocated. Crown law proposes a, set, a mediation. It was to be in person and Dr. Lex would attend. However, the mediation was to be secret so as to protect Dr. Lex. She was not allowed to tell anyone that he was coming back to New Zealand for it, nor she was she even allowed to tell them the time and place of the mediation. This all came about because the Citizens Commission of Human Rights had rung up the Crown Law Office and asked whether the Minister had planned any action against Dr Leakes on his return to New Zealand. So the Crown became aware that people were interested in Dr Leakes. So what did they do? They forced a secrecy provision and said the mediation wouldn't attend, wouldn't proceed unless she committed to this. In contrast to the Citizens Commission's anticipated ministerial action, Crown Council made sure he could get in and out of the country without being held to count by the media, the police, or anyone else. And that was in 1994, or it was later than that. This is despite it knowing that he'd been acting outside all proper therapeutic processes, so I'd been breaching the young resident's rights in a massive way. One has to ask whether it was protecting Dr. Leakes so as to protect its own pockets. 
And then there was the trauma of her attending the mediation, how hard it was to be in the same room as Dr. Leakes. But she believed at the end of it, though it had physically and mentally exhausted her, that there would be action straight away because they would have heard the terrible things that had happened to her. There was no acknowledgement at the mediation or apology or even kind word. As weeks, months and years passed, no attempts were taken to settle her claim. She became debilitated, broken and humiliated at the Crown behaviour. And she found it very hard to raise her children during that time. She was in constant state of stress and trauma. Now, at the mediation, Crown Council had offered $15,000 plus costs to settle her. I'll just stop you there. Um... Is there any issue here about the confidentiality of the mediation process? No, it's been waived. Well, it's been waived. Good. Thank you. That was the top offer. The first was 2,500 plus costs. Clearly, this wasn't a serious attempt to settle her claim, particularly given the much higher amounts Cameron, Grant Cameron's clients received. Now, 18 months since the mediation, the full betrayal of her by Crown lawyers became evident. And this became evident to her when her lawyer read in the paper that the Crown were aiming to settle 88 other claims that had been made later than hers. And they were to be settled by an independent arbitrator, Sir Rodney Gallon, without them even needing to be filed in court. This was the very process that Robert Chambers had recommended that be, be taken for Leone and the other man and all of Grant Cameron's clients. Stealthily, without any advice, notice or consultation with her counsel, Crown lawyers set up and then settled the claim through Sir Rodney, leaving her out in the cold. When, when she first saw in the media that the Crown were planning to settle with Grant Cameron's clients, Philippa asked why Leone was being left out. And he said it was because she'd had the chance to settle and it had failed. This was a cynical response at most. There'd been no real effort to settle with Leone. Its, its strategy is very clear, it was to keep Leone out until um, monetary figures that were much less than what Leone and her council believed were owing had already been set as the benchmark. And in fact, further um, documents that unredacted documents that arrive post evidence and are not before the Commission, but I'm happy to put them in. That is all acknowledged that there were issues around benchmarking and that sort of stuff. These are documents from the Crown, are they? From the Crown. From the Crown, uh, Crown litigation file, yes. We're still for Leone and all claimants then and now. The Crown had settled at very low amounts and I've discussed the reason why and the fact that it had always been her counsel's advice that was important that they settled first to ensure a fair level of compensation for everyone. And it's obvious to avoid the bar being set high, too high, she was cut out. Now, Sir Rodney's approach to distribution as set out there was based on a number of factors, but it was all within the modest sum he had been given to work with and allocate. He, and there's no criticism of the job he did. Um, and it's noted his own horror at what had happened meant that he provided an unsolicited report, which, as I understand it, um, litigation had to be taken to have it released. But there'll be more on that at the Lake Alice inquiry. And then the final great indignity after... It was already well, it had settled with Grant Cameron's it's requiring Leone to go through a psychiatric assessment, which is something you have to do under the Limitation Act. Um, this was 19, so 19 months earlier, Crown Council had indicated shortly after the mediation to Philippa that they might require a psychiatric examination, and they would get back to Philippa in a month. 19 months later, they asked for it. And this was six years, six months since she'd filed her claim. And then I've talked about the further discovery files. So looking at what a different approach would have looked like, unlike the Solicitor General, um, it's submitted that there is plenty of room within a traditional adversarial process to take much more account of the needs of 
a claimant, when a Crown has a conflicted duty, than, than what happened. So looking at paragraph 45, things that could have been done differently. If the Crown was aware of its human rights duties, a priority would have been placed on progressing the litigation without delay. An offer of immediate counselling to support the plaintiff through the process of reliving memories and enduring the litigation process could have been made. A waiver of the limitation defence, given it was beyond doubt that the allegations were true, and I comment further on that later. However, even if the Crown didn't waive the limitation defence, they could have made decisions very early on as to whether an expert psychiatric report was needed, and this be advised to her and actioned as soon as possible. There could have been provision of regular updates, perhaps monthly, of progress on steps the Crown were taking, such as locating documents for discovery, particularly after the mediation. Honesty and transparency in the litigation strategy and advice of steps being taken, including when ministers are involved. Thank <laughs> you.